be a chair at this panel of the what call it the citation community. Uh, the two people who I cited quite a lot in my work. Um, so um, we'll start with um, with Nicolas Zacharias, and we'll talk about ambiguity and uh, policy, right? And progress in kingdom and multiple streams, I guess. More or, more or less, and you have about 30, 40 minutes, and I'll be the rough chair, and I mean, like, five minutes before. Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you very much. Let me take my glasses off. I like seeing you, but I'm better looking without my glasses. So there you go. <laughs> Since we're taking uh, a videotape of me, I've got to be better looking. My, my, better, my better view. Um, I want to thank, first of all, uh, Nessie, since he signs as Nessie, and Naomi for uh, putting together this, uh, this workshop. This is a fantastic opportunity uh, to, to meet, essentially, for me at least, a very different uh, group of people, a different network uh, that I normally don't uh, collaborate with. So I'm very excited to, uh, uh, to see that. And this sort of helps me tie in with some of the stuff that uh, was said before about the uh, uh, what people said before, uh, their personal stuff. Uh, I feel, I too feel the need to establish my comic book uh, credentials. I actually collect comic books. I have all the Asterix that have ever been uh, published. Um, part of it is I used to read them as, as a young boy. And uh, whoever did the translations in Greek was great because the jokes are absolutely incredible. So I thought, I'm going to have to collect all of them. So I have them all. Um, and, and another thing, which is not a joke, um, I, I actually come to uh, this, again, one of those things that ooh, I, other people said it, I wish I had said that too. Um, I, I actually am a latecomer to public policy. I, I, I hear most of you are sort of management and public administration. Actually, by training, I'm a comparativist and an IR uh, expert. Um, so, I like the big questions. I, I come to it from a really, really big question, and as a scholar, I came to public policy. Um, so, I have a wide range of interests, and hopefully in, in my presentation, I'll get you to, to sort of uh, think about those interests. Um, I was given 30 minutes. I'm not going to take 30 minutes. So, hopefully, uh, you'll find that better. I believe in sort of less is more kind of thing, so I'll take about 20 minutes and then I know Alex has uh, uh, to discuss my presentation, so hopefully he'll give you some more food for thought, but I'm mostly interested in what you have to say about what I have to say. So let's, let's start with that. Um, as you can see, there are sort of three elements to my presentation. I'll talk to you about ambiguity just because I always talk about it, uh, but also about the bureaucracy, the role of bureaucracy in that particular um, element, and then more specifically, uh, policy entrepreneurship. You know, wh where does all of this stuff fit together? So here is, uh, Naomi asked about research questions. Well, like a good uh, political scientist, I start with my research question. You know, what is it that I'm trying to do? And essentially, I'm, I'm looking at entrepreneurship strategies. So a very specific slice of policy uh, entrepreneurs. And even more specifically, what strategies are bureaucrats more likely to use under certain conditions? And I specify three conditions. Can there be more conditions? Of course. I can only do three. Probably that's too much. But nevertheless, three conditions, and the conditions are ambiguity, hierarchy, and deadlines. I'll talk to you more about what each means uh, uh, in a moment. So I look at entrepreneurial strategies. Um, I There have been many, actually, uh, papers written recently. Unfortunately, I seem to get all of the... Uh, I probably, those of you who have written about policy entrepreneurship, I was probably one of the reviewers in the, the papers uh, that you wrote because I seem, they seem to be sending me all of these papers, <laughs> different journals, I don't know where they found me, but they keep sending them to me. So 
I took, uh, and there have been some lib reviews, and I took one of the lib reviews and I said, well, okay, well, how many strategies are there? You know, one can have many strategies, and I'm not going to sit down and think about all of them, because somebody else has done it for me. So I looked at the strategies and I adapted their, their uh, literature review to three strategies, issue advocacy and promotion. You know, what do entrepreneurs do? They advocate issues, they promote issues, they make things important and salient. Uh, the second thing is they help build coalition, they broker uh, people coming together, and there is an art to it. Um, finally, this, I had to come up by com all of this by combining several things. For my purposes, uh, they're also knowledge generators, and by that I mean they draft solutions, and they also implement them. They have access to details, and there is a strategy in actually promoting or opposing solutions or helping them succeed or fail. And all of these are part of the entrepreneurial strategy. So I then discuss some expectations. You're know, putting those strategies together. Under these conditions, what, uh, which ones are more likely to be used uh, and when? And I have three expectations. The higher the ambiguity, the higher use of issue advocacy and promotion. When it comes to hierarchy, uh, you have more knowledge generation, and then the other expectation is with deadlines, whenever you have long-term uh, horizons, then you're more likely to use coalition building strategies. Now, by likelihood of use, I mean what's the biggest issue under these conditions. It doesn't necessarily mean that people, will, entrepreneurs, will only use one strategy. They'll use several, of course. But what's the biggest issue? And that tells us where you're going to put sort of most of your eggs. What basket are you going to put most of your eggs? I conceptualize things in a very specific way, so I want to be upfront about it. I see bureaucrats as, as policy entrepreneurs. Obviously, they do other things too. I only look at that dimension. I look at hierarchy primarily as a discretion schema. Obviously, hierarchies can be, are mostly thought of as control mechanisms. I actually see it the opposite way um, as the inverted pyramid of discretion. More discretion at the top, less discretion at the bottom. Where, uh, how, what's the slope and how steep or not steep it is, that's a question of, uh, of rules, of institutions. I look at, okay, so what are the implications of all of this stuff? Finally, I see as de uh, deadlines as <coughs> participation conflict moderators. You use deadlines, in other words, you lengthen the time, you shorten the time, um, in order to um, promote conflict or lessen it, in order to bring people in or uh, avoid them from participating. So I use also um, hierarchy of social scientific analysis. I couldn't come up with a better title. So this sounds scholarly enough, so I thought I'd throw it out at you. <laughs> Essentially what I mean by that is, and I read it, uh, I took it from Ostrom, that's why I have her over there, from the first edition. It has come in later editions. But essentially what I mean is the framework, that, which is a uh, sort of a list of important variables, all of that public policy. Um, the theories, which are the logic of connecting many of these variables to create propositions. Finally, models, which are specific interpretations uh, under certain conditions of these theories, which generate hypotheses. That's what I mean by the hierarchy of social scientific analysis. Framework, theories, models at the bottom. And I use multiple streams to paint the context. This is the framework. I use several theories of entrepreneurship to classify strategies. This is sort of the theory level, if you'd like. And I use scope conditions to qualify the expectations under what conditions, when, etc. These are the models. So let me paint uh, the context. You know, how do I view uh, the environment? And then we'll talk about the scope conditions essentially turbulence, rapid, unexpected change. Most, and that's part of the assumption, mostly we have negative information rather than positive information. By that I mean that we know what we don't want, 
but very rarely we know what we do want. So most of the time we tend to sort of say no to oppose certain things, but we're not necessarily clear or consistent about what exactly are we pursuing. And that's probably the biggest issue in public policy. There always seems to be crisis and urgency. There's always a reason, please, let's do it now, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there is a political um, implication to all of this stuff. There is not just uncertainty, and again, I want to differentiate between uncertainty and ambiguity. Um, ambiguity is essentially a way of, of well, not a way, the interpretation of many irreconcilable ways of looking at the same issue, which means that you can see things either in fuzzy ways, you're not exactly sure, very clear about what is going on, or you don't have clear preferences, uh, but they're also irreconcilable because you cannot trade off one versus another. So that necessarily means that there are many interpretations to the same issue. And these ideas, unlike uncertainty, cannot be reconciled with more information. Uncertainty essentially means you don't know enough, hence you have to discount the future, whatever it is. But if you have more information, then you reduce uncertainty. Having more information, you don't reduce ambiguity. That's the difference. Um, so public policy, again, the context, is an exercise in problem solving, sort of the traditional stuff, but also meaning generation. Oops. So I use multiple streams sort of uh, at the, as the broad context. Just describe to you how it is, how I conceptualize it. <laughs> Very briefly, three streams: problems, policies, politics. I will assume you know some of this stuff, have read it, perhaps. So I'm not going to go into details. If you haven't, please ask questions at the end. We can talk more about it. It's essentially five elements, three streams. The two other elements are policy windows and policy entrepreneurs. So most of the uh, information that I'll talk about now will talk about these policy entrepreneurs how they relate to everything else. And essentially, sort of the main thing behind multiple streams is policy entrepreneurs couple the three streams during open policy windows using skills and strategies. I'm only going to look at strategies, and I'm only going to look at entrepreneurs, and more specifically street level bureaucrats as entrepreneurs. So very, very tiny sliver of this broader scheme. Yeah, I know. I, I like this. I only have one. That's a, it's a good one. Um, just a schematic representation. I always find that, that um, um, a visual representation of a model or a framework is a very good uh, way of sort of putting things into perspective, knowing where they fit. Um, essentially, you have entrepreneurs here, notice strategies, so all sorts of stuff going on just looking at that, and how they put together things during uh, open policy windows. So now to the meat and potatoes <laughs> of the presentation. Um, a couple of things about how these uh, conditions affect street level power, or influence if you'd like. Um, more ambiguity increases street level influence because street level entrepreneurs, no details that can frame issues. So you can be thinking about it as these conditions, sort of you will have increases or decreases in value. What happens to uh, influence of, of street level entrepreneurs? They'll be going up or down. In terms of ambiguity, they'll be going up. Less or very steep uh, hierarchy increases street level power via discretion. By that I mean at extreme levels, you're going to have very, very uh, strong autonomy, if you'd like. We can expect uh, strong influence by street-level uh, entrepreneurs. The less you can probably understand because it means you have more discretion. But here, I also, it's, as I have experienced it personally, actually, the more centralized the system is at the extreme levels, the more autonomous the street-level entrepreneurs become. And, Communist systems are the quintessential example of you have incredible control and nothing happens because the, the top has no idea what's going on at, at the bottom. Um, finally, with deadlines, in terms of uh, longer deadlines, 
increase the power of street level entrepreneurs because they allow them time to actually build coalitions through issue expansion and conflict. <coughs> so the longer the, this issue lasts sort of in, in the public policy arena, the more time street level entrepreneurs have to, to build coalitions opposing usually a particular uh, uh, policy. So to a very large extent, longer deadlines essentially work, not always, but more likely a work as opposition rather than as in favor of adoption of a particular uh, policy. So bureaucracy entrepreneurship. We know bureaucrats are involved in the entire policy process, so I'm not going to go into details. You know that, and we know that from third generation implementation, that literature, that that happens. They have access, they have resources, to the policy uh, making process. So I'm going to focus only on strategies. Under what conditions are these things, uh, are, is success, if you like, uh, likely? And here I argue that more ambiguity places a premium on, on framing issues. And therefore, and by framing, I mean how knowledge is used. Because it helps you as a, as a bureaucrat frame for the policy makers what is important, what is not important. You have access, you have access through issue advocacy, you have access through feedback within the system. You get the feedback from the clients and therefore you can report whether some things are successful, some things are not successful, what are the issues, and therefore you have the power to make some things more salient than others. Under this condition, perhaps some theories that can help us generate interesting hypotheses involve prospect theory frameworks, and I give you some uh, uh, examples. Of course, they they've written forever about this stuff. Hierarchy is is a very interesting uh, idea in that here I, I hypothesize that the steeper the hierarchy, sort of the, the yeah sharper the angle, uh, it limits discretion at the, uh, uh, the street level. We know that, but it also privileges the production of knowledge. It is, it gives entrepreneurs, a bureaucrats especially, a more active role to play, especially in the policy stream. Here you're in the problem stream, here now with framing. Here you're in the policy stream. Most of the work is actually done in ministries. Essentially, they are the ones who write all the bills, uh, but they are then debated. Therefore, they sit down and think of the blueprints of what these solutions are likely to uh, to look like. Uh, so the, the the heart of the matter uh, is being done within bureaucracies, and there is a good reason for that. The steeper the bureaucracy, the more power you have, especially at the lower level, primarily because you generate uh, the knowledge. You receive messages from policymakers, you receive feedback from clients. Um, and here, perhaps some good uh, ways of uh, generating hypotheses would involve motivation theory from psychology. A whole lot of that stuff comes from psychology. Um, Again, I'm giving you examples. Uh, finally, with deadlines, longer deadlines, when you elongate the, the process, uh, you increase um, issue, issues, uh, issue activation. You activate more people to come uh, to the policy process, and therefore, you increase the likelihood of conflict, prompting coalition building for or against uh, particular uh, issues. Here. I connect all of this stuff with policy windows. You can, if you, you can think of deadlines, or a particular type of deadlines, as either endogenous or exogenous. Uh, deadlines, think of them as interruptions in a process. They can be artificial or not, meaning that they can be like part of the electoral cycle. You know, every four years you have elections, so you know exactly what is happening, how much time you have. However, there can be deadlines imposed by the judiciary, for example. You know, you've got to do something within, you know, a year or something. 
which means that they artificially shorten <laughs> or elongate uh, the process. And here we can use, I've written something specifically on deadlines, uh, where uh, I've differentiated between endogenous and exogenously imposed uh, deadlines. And they have a very different uh, impact on conflict expansion, which means that <coughs> you can have strategies that are more defensive in nature, depending on the deadline. Defensive meaning that um, you're trying to oppose uh, whatever is being proposed, or more expansive in nature, more uh, aggressive in nature. So far we have assumed that these things happen discreetly. But what happens when all of these three conditions are simultaneously valid? You know, we, we assume that there is you know, more ambiguity, there's more hierarchy, etc., etc. Well, in real life, you have all of these things at the same time. So how do we know then what strategies are, are most likely to be used? So here is the assumption. Assuming that entrepreneurs are pursuers of efficiency, meaning that you are going to do a cost-benefit analysis and you are going to expend resources on a strategy that will yield the most benefits to you. Then other things being equal, hierarchy is going to be the more uh, important one, which essentially means they are going to be, bureaucrats are likely to be more important and use strategies that are um, involved in implementation, I'm not saying something terribly uh, original, or drafting uh, solutions. So what are the implications for policy theory? You know, we've, we've made this argument, yeah. what does all of this stuff mean? I'll give you a chance to read actually the joke, because mm -hmm. that's the funny one. That's, that's, if you get something out of this, this is it, it's right there. <laughs> Can you read it? Oh man, that, that loses the effect. <laughs> Essentially it says he gives a, a very impressive model. And, and in the model we have, and she responds, a metaphor for how we feel, how we all feel late on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Terribly confused. Now that I have you confused, let me sort of distill the, um, the essence. We need to embed entrepreneurship within policy theory. I know theories of policy entrepreneurship sort of um, are, are a pursuit in and of themselves, and that's a good thing, but we have to make sure that we embed them within policy frameworks. Otherwise, we lose um, the big picture, the so what uh, element. Theory must be contingent, meaning that there's gotta be scope, conditions that yield hypotheses that tell us when things are happening and why. Strategies, blah, 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 affect the, uh, the interface between actors and institutions. But what I wanted to, to sort of address here, go back to that hierarchy of social scientific analysis, we have a framework, we need to have a framework, we need to embed these um, policy entrepreneurship theories underneath that whatever framework you want, you don't have to use multiple streams. But then, I hope that each of us can specify several models within those theories to empirically verify the, um, the hypotheses. We need comparative empirical verification. And I use the comparative there um, in, in, in sort of a broad sense, and it needs to be systematic, across sectors within a single context, across states, maybe one sector, across several states, if you're really good, several sectors across several states, and the same thing across different levels of government, because you will have very, very different expectations, I assume, and I'm, 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 I'm expecting, and therefore different results. Finally, we need to, and I wanted to, to leave you with that, we need to ask the big questions. I am a big fan of big questions. And then the, the question becomes, are bureaucratic entrepreneurs, are these entrepreneurship uh, strategies a good thing for democracy? We tend to look at all of these things in terms of effectiveness, 
taking care of business. You know, you got to address the topic. In terms of efficiency, you save us money, yay. But at the end of the day, is it good for democracy? Is does it make us more accountable? Are we getting things that are important to us as a democratic society? In terms of policy theory, we have learned not to ask these questions. Well, maybe we have steered away from these questions in the pursuit of efficiency, especially, and effectiveness. But we need to address these questions, perhaps go back to them, or at least make them a portion of our answer. And with that, Thank you very much, and I'm happy, <laughs> happy to take any questions as we have the discussion. Go to the chair. Okay, so we'll take uh, about 10 15 minutes for questions now, uh, and then we'll move to the next And we start with the discussion. Oh, it will be easier for you yeah, to. Okay, be. so. Write down your questions and we'll move yeah. to the next. So our next speaker, do you want to come here? Well, I was just standing to relax when I country was going through a very, very significant uh, reforms based on uh, principles of neoclassical economics so in the late 1980s. And I was assigned to work on um, education policy. Uh, one of the things that in the time that I was there, it was about three years, something that really struck me was that somehow there was a group of people in and around that organisation who had immense power in terms of getting their ideas translated into actions on the ground. And, and, and I was very curious about how that, how that happened. And that really was what led me to go away and study. And um, then I worked with um, Mark Schneider and Paul Teske as, as thesis supervisors, and they were interested in the notion of the public entrepreneur. I think they, they used the term political entrepreneur. Right. Uh, and that led me to, to, to work that I did. And, and this little sort of thing about something that if you hang around for long enough and this game stuff comes back to you, that um, last year I was asked to uh, contribute to a volume on looking at successful public policy. And one of the things that we've defined successful public policy is stuff that hangs around for a long time. And the assignment that came to me was talk about the changes that happened in New Zealand in the 1980s. And uh, there's been a big literature around that now. So I actually went back and wrote about that time that I had actually been involved with, but was able to do it from, from the benefit of the, of the hindsight of a lot of it, people who you know, pulling together what everyone knew at that time. And I still have to say that it's extremely impressive what a small group of people did and the strategies they used. Now, I'm not sure that in the paper <coughs> that I wrote recently, I, I even used the term policy entrepreneur to describe them, but certainly my thinking about what policy entrepreneurs do is very much in the back of that, and I think um, it ties into some of the strategies that uh, you were talking about uh, today. Uh, Nick, I call you Nick? What do I call you, Nick? Nick? Sure, Nick. I mean, in Australia, everyone's like Nick. Nick. Yeah. Nick's agree. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, maybe I'd call it Nicky, but it's name. <laughs> Come Wednesday, you know? Uh, all right, so. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the slide to show that it's not a stream of consciousness. So I wanted to start by thinking about the notion of policy entrepreneurs as a distinct, distinct class of actors. And one thing I would say about this is I don't think that I've seen, or maybe 
maybe everyone in this room here has buried them <laughs> during, the, during the, uh, the submission process. I haven't seen any papers published that basically said that this work, line of work on policy entrepreneurs is just a complete crock, you know, that it just is, uh, they should just stop right away. So I'm sort of curious about thinking about what it means to, to consider this group as, as distinct actors. Uh, then I want to come back to thinking about it with context, and I think this really lines up with what you were talking about, is you've got to think about this stuff in context, and, and, uh, and also in context of the bigger theories of, of, of the policy process. Uh, then I'm just going to talk about these other, other points. So I'll just sort of have a slide for each. This first one, uh, this notion of distinct class of actors, it seems to me that when we study and call people policy entrepreneurs, they're not just, there's not just this pure category of person who is a policy entrepreneur. They're, they're always going to be, they're going to have multiple identities, like they could be an elected politician. This is the kind of thing the kingdom was saying. Uh, but then, it, then the thing becomes interesting. So I've just got a list of, you know, activist, concerned citizen, various other things there. Is, um, well, if we think that they're a distinct class of actors, in what ways are they distinct? Because actually a lot of the things that they're doing are the things that all these other people would do as well. A smart business person would do these things. Um, an interest group leader would do them. And so another thing I want to just move over here uh, for a minute. Um, how, how might we measure hypothesized entrepreneurial attributes? Um, and again, I sort of think it's a, 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 the point that you made is about the comparative approach here. That we might want to compare um, among individuals being policy entrepreneurs. So what are the sort of the, I, I think of the attributes of them as, as like they're, they're highly motivated, right? But, um, they, they, um, they, they're very good at uh, reading social situations and, and, and a range of different things like that uh, listed down as attributes. But then again, you'd expect that uh, a lot of other political actors uh, would do that as well. So I wouldn't, only thinking about looking at policy entrepreneurs and thinking about the attributes that they demonstrate among them, see if there is stuff here that resonates that suggests they're a class of actors, but also putting it to the test and saying, well, how different is that from other actors? Why, why I'm suggesting this is I'm basically saying, I think that the study of policy entrepreneurs is now at a sufficient level of maturity that to actually get in there and say, so what? You know, how special are they? Is not to be a sort of a put down and say, this, this is all, all just fictional. It's actually saying, well, what can we find out about, the, about their behaviours uh, it, it, through this kind of work, and I'm not suggesting it's, it's easy at all. I mean, it's 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 kind of hard to, to 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 think about how you might do some of this work. It's not impossible, but it's, it would require a little bit of uh, here. Uh, okay, policy entrepreneurship in context. Now, this slide here uh, sort of starts here and then goes. <laughs> um, uh, how we might deepen our knowledge of policy entrepreneurship in context, and I'm thinking here, and again, this resonates a bit with some of the things that that Nick said and that have also been said earlier today. Uh, so um, the, uh, the policy making process, whereabouts are they? Where do policy entrepreneurs choose to be active? And I guess in the, in the Kingdom's, Kingdom's uh, version of the story, they're almost always at the agenda setting stage. But what we know, say from your work, uh, is that they, they can be very uh, crafty sometimes at the implementation stage. Uh, sometimes they might use um, evaluation as the starting point. You know, say, say there's a problem here that I don't like, uh, and this would, this would be consistent with, say, the, the notion of policy images that comes through from Bloom Gartner and Jones's work, that chipping away at the policy image of a, of a policy monopoly, how you might do that is through actually commissioning or being involved in evaluation. So that's, that, that's a different way of thinking about um, uh, points in the policy cycle than, than that these are people who are simply around agenda setting. Um, also, and this, this is uh, again kind of something that others in the room talked a little bit about today. What are they, where, what, what levels of government do they position themselves in? Uh, and I suppose, uh, again, this goes back, uh, Boom Gartner and Jones thought about this the notion of, of venue shopping. Why do we see people working in particular areas? What, what's, what's the point you're trying to, why do you, why do you go in at the local level when you could have gone at the state level? Or, do you start at the national level? Is the more chance that you're going to get knocked back if you start there than if you start somewhere else? Uh, that kind of thing. I think there's quite a lot of room uh, more for thinking about that kind of contextual stuff. Uh, none of this is easy work. That's why I'm <laughs> too hard. <laughs> but I thought I'd tell you because you're, you're a bunch, you know, a smart bunch. 
Um, and then I guess the other thing is that this, uh, and, and Alex, you're, you're working on this, you're going to give a paper on this, is the emergence of policy in the non-Western uh, political environments. And there's a couple of things there that I think is very interesting about that, that sort of work is, one, you can use what we know about policy entrepreneurs and the strategies they use, the attributes they, 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 they demonstrate to, to, to make sense of, of political processes in, in places where this, hasn't, this kind of framework hasn't been used before. The other side of it that I think is really good, and maybe that's more sort of a, from an academic point of view, is it's yet another way to test and actually say, well, uh, what happens with, with this way of thinking about political processes and structure and agency when you put it in very different contexts than those where the, where the term was coined in the first place, so, i.e. Uh, you know, John Kingdon thinking about uh, the Congress in, 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 in the United States. So there's been a degree of sort of, and I, would, I, I could be accused of this, a degree of taking the, the, that approach of policy entrepreneurs and sort of plonking it down in different contexts and just saying sort of same old, same old here, doesn't matter whether it's Australia or, or, or the US or, or, or someplace else. Uh, but I think we need to be thinking back through a little bit more. I want to just uh, put another part in here, uh, and this is talking about what we should always ask when we're studying policy entrepreneurs, and it's just a sort of a checklist of questions. So, um, what are the other sort of political, social, economic factors that are going on here? It's kind of like, can we explain the change going on here in the absence of policy entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. so it's really sort of saying, what's the counterfactual? Um, so you'd also be wanting to say, what actors and interests uh, tend to have more influence in this context, and why is that? What is it that, you know, like why, say, particularly unions might have, have, have power, may have had power for a long time, uh, and then, uh, if the policy entrepreneurs weren't present, uh, you know, would you see shifts from the status quo? Again, it's not to sort of say policy entrepreneurs aren't important, but it's actually saying if we really believe in, in, in the power of this conceptual approach, then we should be prepared to really put it to the test in, in, this, in this kind of way. Uh, strategies of policy entrepreneurs, and uh, again, I'm really uh, pleased you have answered this first question, so what strategies do they use? Uh, but I think that we could actually uh, do some more sort of systematic work in this um, uh, and, and compare the uses that policy entrepreneurs make of, of strategies. We know, and so that's, I think this is really where your work is really you know, pushing us down the line there further in this way and really, really helpful. Uh, so it's sort of, you know, I, I would say these are, these are kind of like elaborations on the points that you made. What strategies they use, when do they use them, why and what effect. Um, uh, and, and this one here comes back to how they like other actors. You know, like if they're, if they're negotiators, then how different is that from, say, a, 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 a prime minister or a, some power broker in the cabinet? Uh, and then this last question can't be taught. I know that it doesn't sort of line up there. What, when, how, why uh, can't be taught. But, you know, PowerPoint. But I actually kind of think this is really an interesting question. Like, uh, I. I I really, we were actually having a, a chat over, over, over afternoon tea about this, that when we teach classes about policy entrepreneurs, you know, like I occasionally get invited to teach, usually they regret it. <laughs> 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 um, uh, you know, people love to talk about changing the world, and so there's this sort of thought that uh, we could actually take some of these strategies and, and, and how could we take them to teach, but of course there's a whole bunch of books around you know, how do you negotiate well, how do you frame things up. You know, so what is it that's so special about this? But um, on the other hand, I, I'm really impressed by the kind of uh, work that's been out there that has actually said, you know, how to, how to be a policy entrepreneur in an organisation. You know, it's actually taken some of that stuff <coughs> and, and, and applied it and pulled this through. So I think there's a lot of room, room for more exploration of the strategies that, that policy entrepreneurs use. And, and again, you know, maybe we come down and say that, uh, what would it be? So like, um, Maybe some policy entrepreneurs are like gifted amateurs. You know, they're, they're kind of good at doing, putting a few things together. Whereas there are always going to be people out there who are better at singularly doing some things. But this is stuff we don't know. We don't know about this, and we need to. I think it would be really helpful to know about that. Uh, all right, I'm going to flip on to now. I talked about maybe thinking about strategies for policy entrepreneurs. Next, I'm going to talk about assessing their impact. Uh, and I think here is an area where there's a lot of extra work to be done. Now, one of the things, and I, I you know, I'd be pretty cool myself actually here, yeah. a lot of instances we see uh, the, a policy entrepreneur is present and we talk about policy change. And quite often what we do is say, 
wow, some change happened. Wouldn't it be interesting to go back and look at how that happened? And let's find the, the policy entrepreneur. And I've, I've done that. I'm not, you know. <laughs> but what is that called? Selection on the dependent variable, right? So it's a naughty thing to do in you know, my social science. You know what you need to do, it, right? You need to sort of start somewhere else. Oh, okay, let me just start here. No policy entrepreneur present and no change. I try publishing that. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, you know, so that one is just to be consistent. Right? But, um, but some of the other ones are kind of interesting. Um, uh, the policy entrepreneur is present, pushing away stuff, and no change happens. And, you know, why is that? And, and if we have a, a better understanding of context, then we can really start to say, well, they just couldn't do it because they, it was like you could be a really, you know, a, a, I know some of you in the room, you talked about this earlier, you're really good runners, all right? So next time you go out running, if you see some a, a big strip of, of freshly laid concrete, you know, you're not going to run through that to see how fast you can run, right? Because you're just going to get bogged down. But you could be a really great sprinter and you're in concrete, you're not going to get anywhere. And that seems to me that's one of the dilemmas that, that a policy entrepreneur really faces. So we might talk about someone who's been brilliantly entrepreneurial. Why? Because they won the race? Well, what about the one who actually <laughs> didn't win the race but <laughs> made a gallant effort through the concrete, you know? Um, so we don't really talk about that enough, I don't think. Uh, and um, maybe this one here is the one that... that that, that we don't want to know about too much of that because it's like the change has no policy entrepreneur, so what do we do then with our theory? <laughs> <laughs> have you got a suggestion for uh, Then you call it, <laughs> that's an aberration, an outlier. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, right. that's, 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 that's what you mean by ambiguity. <laughs> <laughs> it's ambiguity. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. Now, um, it's a miracle. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> a miracle. Thanks, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, there's a, I have, you know, tried to sort of. <laughs> no one's told me to shut up yet, so take that <laughs> uh, All right, so um, I just thought that the notion of dynamic change, policy entrepreneurs and dynamic change, there's actually probably more that we could say about this. There's some, something sometimes if we uh, start thinking about policy entrepreneurship, say the study of it 25, 30 years ago, tended to be people looking at a particular case of a change and exploring what the policy entrepreneur did. And that's okay, but I think that what, we, what would really be helpful, and I think this really does start to resonate with, with the point you made about, about the so what, the big picture thing, is that if we believe that policy entrepreneurs really matter, then how do they, what is it that they do that, that can engineer dynamic change across systems? Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be really big news kind of thing that has to be done in the future. So I'm very... I'm very confident that the the concept of the entrepreneur, you know, it's got a lot of mileage in it yet, and it's also the sort of stuff that if we if we can really understand what they're doing, this could be extremely helpful for people who are practical actors in the world wanting to make it, make the world a better place and all the rest of it. Right, so, uh, what are the sort of things about promoting uh, dynamic policy change? Well, obviously, you know, politics matters, so it's that ability to interpret the environment, a lot of the things that you talked about, Nick. Uh, the design of policy matters. Uh, you know, you'd like to think that you actually have a policy that's, that's better than, than what you've, was already in place, so no use being an effective policy entrepreneur in the end. You can be one of those kind of clever, you know, it's probably clever, right? These ones who, that can be politically clever at pushing on a policy that is, is bad policy. So well, that's an interesting thing. It raises a big normative question, doesn't it? You know, you know like uh, probably half the half the presidents in the United States thought the other half were, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, so there's a question there. Uh, but you would think that the design of policy matters to uh, dynamic change. If, if people think, yeah, this is a really great way of solving a particular problem, say, say like something like a, a goods and services tax, a general goods and services tax, or something that's you know like uh, um, straightforward. Things like that can, can actually move quickly across the fuse across systems. And then the framing, uh, and, you know, the, the, how someone frames a particular um, a problem is, is critically important to the reception that it gets and that kind of thing. So I think that there's more, a lot that we could say about uh, the dynamic change stuff. And the last thing I want to say, which is in some ways I think um, is actually the same thing, but. Uh, is the notion of scaling strategies, and um, it's you know like one of the, one of the uh, areas early kind of work that was done on, on policy entrepreneurs 
Um, was Nancy Roberts uh, was one of the people who we're talking about her book today, and Paula, um, Paula King, Paula King, King and Roberts, and they, they studied uh, policy entrepreneurs in, in, in Minneapolis, uh, in Minnesota, about introducing school choice. My um, PhD dissertation was on policy entrepreneurs and school choice. And I come up with this topic, and then I was looking around one sort of summer, going and looking, and, and, and I found this um, PhD thesis and this on policy entrepreneurs <laughs> school choice. And I told my thesis supervisor, Mark Schneider, he said, well, well you're stuck there, aren't you? Uh, well, it actually turned out something kind of interesting, uh, that, that it was a really great detailed case, a case study of, of this team of people in, in, in Minnesota and the efforts that they made to, to get school choice there. And, and it became really helpful for me because it was A, showing that there was a phenomenon that was worth studying, and then what I did is actually just say, okay, well, can we sort of replicate that kind of study across all the, all the 50 states and do something quantitative here, which is what I did. But um, uh, the, the question that, that comes back to me on this is something like this. Those, those successful policy entrepreneurs in Minnesota were they, when they did that, would they have been satisfied purely to have said, we got the, we got the change we wanted in Minnesota, now we, now we move on to other things? Or did they want more? And one of them actually told me, and then I verified this with some others, just later on another project, they actually told me about how they were really saying, Minnesota is a small state, so what we really need to do is get some big punch, so what do we do? Well, we go to California, because that's one of the biggest, most populous states. And they started doing some stuff there. They talked about using quiet power, <laughs> which is you know sort of, sort of interesting stuff. So I think that they were kind of kind of keen to do that. But I, I guess the bigger question that I have here is how much can people who are wanting to make dynamic change happen? How far down the how far down the um, down the road can they see? And how how interested in further down the road are they? Because uh, I just think some extremely fascinating things happen. Uh, when, when we look at uh, the actions of certain policy entrepreneurs that lead us on, I, I suppose it's, you know, it's into the realm of path dependence or, or something like that. If this person hadn't, or if this group of people hadn't made this change here, what would have happened? And I, I, I can really think of some very cool instances of stuff that's happened further down the track that I don't think would have happened as it hadn't been for a particular group of policy entrepreneurs early on. I mean, just just one one thing again. I'm, I'm really fascinated by by education, education change. That um, the school choice stuff in the U.S. Uh, was sort of a precursor to people got school choice and you know open enrollment, but then there wasn't much actual choice happening. So then another second wave of stuff came in where they looked, set up these schools called charter schools. So it was actually creating a new supply, working on the supply side, creating new schools. So. Then, um, you know, a few years back, I came across this uh, book um, by a guy called Doug Lamont, called Teach Like a Champion. And it's a very fascinating study because Doug Lamont looked at uh, school, um, successive kids in school tests, like maths tests, and poverty rates. And what you, their expectation is that the higher the poverty rate in the school, the lower the results of kids on test scores. And that's generally true. If you just put it, scatter it all out there, you'd basically fit a line and it would be a negatively related line. But then what Doug Lamont noticed was that there were some schools, and this was looking at, at the state of New York, some schools where there was 100% poverty, as Judge Judson White was, and uh, kids were scoring extremely high on, on, the, on the test. So his question was, what's going on in those schools? What are the teachers doing in those schools that's different from the teachers in the other schools where the kids are not getting such great results? So we went in there, videotaped, did all the kind of stuff, understanding what was going on there, and actually wrote it up as a manual for teachers. Why? Because he was running charter schools and he wanted to run really good schools. And so he had this kind of unpublished bunch of stuff. And he was like, this is amazing. Every teacher should know of this. So he writes this book up. And suddenly it becomes a, a bestseller. Now, a heap of teachers in the US have read it. Like a quarter of, of teachers in the system have read it. And the book's been translated into 10 languages. And so me, so, so if someone interested in policy entrepreneurs think, well, if the policy entrepreneurs in Minnesota hadn't pushed this stuff, Doug Lamont probably never would have written that book. But it's a cool book. And it really changes things. So that's sort of what I'm interested in. OK, now I'm going to just move on to this last point. And that is that if you think about 
the, the, the UN's uh, uh, sustainable development goals, then this strikes me as this, this set of goals is like, that's a big challenge. This is the big picture challenge that all of us, anywhere we're located in the world, have to actually start addressing all of this stuff. And it seems to me that if, 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 if we can understand how policy entrepreneurs can make a difference in some of these areas, then there's so much that could be learned that would be incredibly valuable. But I think what we need to start doing then is actually sort of think about the chains of activity that go from the big goal down to change right at the, at the street level. So that's why this is such an important workshop. It seems like a number of reasons why it's important. But for my mind, it's actually like we absolutely want to get those changes at the street level. We want to get the stuff on the ground changing. Otherwise, you do all the stuff in, in New York, you know, on the, by the East River. It's like, so what? So what? It didn't, didn't change anything on the ground. So how do you get that to happen? You know what? Well, that's the stuff I think we really need to do. And, and in terms of, uh, I'm going to shut up now, but, um, but in terms of the methodology around this, uh, what I love about this whole area that people have, have contributed to policy entrepreneurship, and, and many of you in the room, you know, it's really, a, it's really a great example of mixed methods. But all of us, I think, when we're driven, theoretically driven, then it doesn't matter greatly what the method is, uh, so long as we can kind of, you know, lay the found foundation, the seed corn for further work to be done. And I think that that's exactly where we are right now with things like the, uh, the UN's um, Sustainable Development Goals and studying policy entrepreneurship that could, could contribute to that. That there's many starting points and probably all of them could be fruitful so long as they're driven by theory. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop. Special experience by serving as the discussant of the writers of your undergraduate textbooks and, and, and readings. You know, I started my postgraduate training by reading, you know, the, the books and the articles written by these two gentlemen, and uh, it's a, such a great privilege by, by being discussant of their, their of their talks. I think they both of them have to really kick off this fascinating academic journey with so much wisdom and so on and so forth. So probably I'll start from the paper written by the, 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 the PPD, uh, the sort of presentation done by Nikos. First of all, I think this is a very interesting uh, workshop, uh, academically very valuable, because when you look at the study of policy entrepreneurship, it basically starts from Joe Kingdom, right, the multiple streams model and so on and so forth. So, but we all know that the, the sort, of, sort of policy entrepreneurship version 1.0 was sort of constrained with the uh, stage of agenda setting, right? But with 20, 30 years of theoretical development, we have gone beyond agenda setting. And basically, as both of them have mentioned, now we can virtually find out lots of studies going beyond that, basically every stage of the policy cycle, especially in implementation. And you know, just as a, you know, Michael just mentioned, that even in policy evaluation stage, we can find out the footprint of policy entrepreneurs. So by moving from version 1.0 to 2.0, we actually find out that the implementation stage is where changes can also be made, not only by top-level uh, policymakers, but also by uh, the sort of you know, street-level bureaucrats. This is, uh, this, I think this conference, this workshop, can actually sort of create a very good synergy between policy studies literature and public administration literature, because street-level bureaucrats is very sizable body of literature by Lipset, right, in, pu in public administration. And then, but in the past, we hardly see any sort of you know attempt of bridging these two great bodies of literature for greater knowledge, and this is a very great contribution. And one of the, if you look at the literature, especially some uh, I think several several years ago in PSJ, the Romanian journal, right, there was a special issue that you know tried to give up a sort of reflection on multiple streams model. One of the critiques to this body of the literature is that it's predominantly smaller, small sample size, small n, in case study, interpretive, descriptive, and so on and so forth. So one of the directions suggested by the authors is that we need to go beyond qualitative and try to opt for some large sample size, in, increase the external validity, and so on and so forth. But one barrier to really opt for that quantitative approach is to, is really you need to some, have some sort of testable hypothesis. I think in this regard, I think Nikos has done a very, very good job you know, remember in one of the, his early slides, he gave us some sort of expectations. That is essentially some sort of hypothesis that can be used to be tested in large sample size setting. And then this may actually open the door for more knowledge of 
more nuanced the patterns of behavioral traits and strategies of uh, street level street level policy entrepreneurs as composed as opposed to you know the generic type of policy entrepreneurs because street level bureaucrats they have some sort of very substantial differences as compared to ordinary the sort of top level policy entrepreneurs in the sense that they are bonded by very rigid civil service rule, right? And then they are almost all oftentimes uh, deadline driven, right? They have to face a variety, a full range of accountability mechanisms and so on and so forth. So basically the characterization of street last level policy entrepreneurs is remarkably different from the general knowledge we have learned so far about the general type of policy entrepreneurs. So they face because they face different, you know, set constraints, external and the internal. So I think these three hypotheses are raised by Nichols are very, very valuable. And then I was also want to say that uh, if you actually broaden the scope of analysis from the sort of hardcore public sector into a broader public sector, for example, if you include lots of the public service agencies like public hospitals, public you know, schools, universities, we actually might have a more, you know, uh, the, the opportunity of having more knowledge because, for example, myself come from a you know the background of health policy, social welfare policy. We understand that in there are some very special policy sectors where there is very high degree of information asymmetry, for example, healthcare, and high professional autonomy, and then also uh, sort of very high level of, of administrative discretion. I think these are areas where street level bureaucrat, you know, street level policy entrepreneurship might be more likely to succeed. So, and we also have lots of, you know, knowledge has been created from, you know, other uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, areas of study, for example, management sciences and healthcare science studies and so on and so forth. And uh, so by moving to, to Michael's uh, presentation, it's also, thank you for sharing with me your, your full paper. And uh, so first of all, he basically did a very comprehensive uh, literature review on the theoretical development of policy entrepreneurship. And we all know that policy entrepreneurship started from, was embedded firstly in multiple streams model, right? And then policy entrepreneurs couple the three streams. So, but by and large, policy entrepreneur or policy entrepreneurship <coughs> itself is not a theory. It's barely a organizing concept or sometimes we call it a explanatory concept. In itself, it, it doesn't constitute a separate body of literature of theory because it doesn't specify the causal links, right? And so on and so forth. So basically, but what I think gradually what we can do is, the question I want to ask is, PE is embedded in policy cycle model, but at the same time, with the development, theoretical development, can policy entrepreneurship study contribute and enrich the theory of policy cycle or, and policy process? So tomorrow I'll be sharing with you some, uh, two special issue plans I'm currently working and in one of, our, uh, in one of the yeah, papers um, done by Michael Hollett from Simon Fraser University, he has, actually has done a very, very good job. He, worked, he, so he basically approached this question from another perspective, from the other way around. So he basically further delineated public, uh, policy entrepreneurs and characterized the six types of policy entrepreneurship. And then he came up with a sort of so-called six-stream variant of, of three streams model. So that is a very good way to move forward. So uh, basically, uh, PE is not a theory in itself, but it may be able to contribute to other major the theoretical frameworks. And as both of them mentioned, for example, uh, advocacy, collision theory, and the punctuated equilibrium, and these mainstream theories, and so on. So, and another thing is, uh, Michael mentioned uh, about the, the measurement, right? So one of the methodological uh, challenges to this um, field of study is that how to measure, right? How to measure the attributes quantitatively, in a quantitative manner, the attributes, the, the, the uh, strategies and the motivations. Um, so, uh, so far, if you look at the literature, most of these studies working, looking at the motivations of, of policy entrepreneurs, basically took a retrospective perspective, right? And then you look at a successful policy entrepreneurial reform, and then you, you basically coin that person, that leader, or group of leaders as policy entrepreneurs, and then you look at the sort of behavioral traits, their sort of you know, uh, um, psychological profile, and so on. And then the question is, can we predict 
if you call you, you yourself a theory, you, you, you need to have the sort of analytical power to predict, right? So in this regard, and tomorrow I'll be sharing with you very, you know, very quickly um, one of the studies submitted to our special issue, uh, a group of American scholars, and then they actually used psychological uh, theories to examine a very large sample of Chinese bureaucrats to look at their personality. And so they basically found out that they, they, they are able to predict who is more likely to become entrepreneurs, policy entrepreneurs in the future. And so this is kind of, of course, that, that study has lots of, some sort of methodological challenges, flaws, and so on. But th I think that is a very good way to move this field of study into a more quantitative, more scientific manner. So, and one last thing is about the methods. And uh, so, uh, one last thing is about actually about the context. And as Michael mentioned, you know, it's worthwhile to really examine uh, the policy entrepreneurs and policy entrepreneurship in non-Western uh, political systems because the you know the institutional framework and the contexts are, are so different. But so far, if you look at the you know the, the very thin body of literature, you know, set in non-developed non countries, for example, in Asia, in developing countries, we actually did a quite a sort of literary survey. We found no more than 50 journal articles published in mainstream policy policy, policy studies or PA journals, which are actually not policy entrepreneurship in Asia or in developing countries, no more than 50. So this sort of literature is, is very, very thin. So the conclusion we have got is basically context matters. But how context matters is still very unclear. So lots of studies, many of the, the studies are actually based in China, in India, and other than that, the, the sort of the scope and the depth of knowledge is very limited. So I look forward <coughs> to more studies and more comparative studies. So comparative studies very valuable approach to generate more knowledge and and then in terms of understanding how context really matters. So I look forward to more you know, discussions and thank you both speakers. Thank you.
Um, at least from the, my long list of, uh, of policy changes, I know most of them started as non-compliance. And I, I, I'm not sure I can recall like a policy that without any policy entrepreneurship involved. Sometimes it's not like identified with a policy entrepreneur, like there are policy changes that you see the policy entrepreneur and you can identify like the person who did the change. But many other cases, it's the policy entrepreneurship happens uh, uh, in some parts or some stages. And if, if there is no entrepreneurship, maybe that it wouldn't progress. I think Higgins said the same. He said that if you look at any policy change behind, and he said any policy change, you can find some policy entrepreneur. One, two. Yeah. So, so. Um, yeah, but, so this but then is the question is, what do you mean with policy change? Yeah. I mean, that's a very broad concept. We are talking in terms of broad concepts. But mm -hmm. Policy change. What do you mean that now? Mm -hmm. In this discussion, I, I mean that there was something written that something replaced something else. At least in, in my mind, that's the way I think about it. I'm not talking about change. So I want to say, I want to say, like a docu formal, a, a documented change. I don't want to. I'm, I'm afraid of this big word institution. I want to yeah. say that something was written as replaced something else, or was added on something else, and it was written by the people who are responsible for this and the, the, the officials that. Are, are can uh, make the change. I agree with you, policy change, it's a huge concept. So sometimes it happens, you know, in the government, sometimes it happens in the ministry. So, so then, if, if, if I may, Madam Chair, so then your reference point for the change is the, the policy on paper? Yes, uh, in this discussion. But, but uh, I, I would say the reference point is uh, T1 versus T0, or T1 versus the, uh, two, if I'm expressing myself clearly, I would say it's it's it needs it needs a chronological comparison. Yes. To talk about change. Yes. You see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. That's for sure. That's but but, but even documented changes can include legislative changes and executive changes. You know, these two types of changes in my own very different dynamics, right? Yeah. No, that, that's where I'm, well, yeah. again, this is not. I'm not. Mm. I'm just saying that. If there is a change, a formal change, that you can you see the document, I'm not talking change on the ground, I'm talking formal written policy as written change. I can't think about an example that there was no entrepreneurship entrepreneurs involved in it. Sometimes it's more than one, sometimes it's a it's a group, some, so I don't know if we can say policy entrepreneurship is a theory, like standalone theory. But I, I'm, I'm certainly certain it's, a, it's a, like a part in each policy change uh, 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 theory that uh, um, that we know. So, so taking this table of two by two, um, I wonder how can we compare the the there are entrepreneurs, no change, and there are entrepreneurs, and there is a change. And I think that this is. But again, it's in, in a time frame context, but maybe if we look at it a year after, the change is there. Okay, and, you know, change. I would like to increase the challenge and, and uh, challenge the concept of change. Uh, do we necessarily uh, uh, talk about change? Because in many cases, keeping the status quo uh, uh, needs much more uh, creativity, a uh, lot of strategies, and, and maybe uh, political entrepreneurship is also about any kind of policy, uh, also keeping the policy as it is. Um, so, so maybe it is not a matter of change uh, necessarily, but uh, some other some other things. Well. Um First of all, I, I think that policy entrepreneurs are individuals who are trying to exploit opportunities in order to promote their goals without, without having the necessary resources to do it by themselves. So they are trying to 
change or to influence the outcomes. Uh, perhaps we, we don't have to talk about change, but they are uh, putting their uh, energy uh, in order to, 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 to influence outcomes. Um, and from that, I would like to go back to the normative uh, issue, to the normative question. I'm, I'm very curious to know what is your opinion on this uh, question. And this question is whether or not policy entrepreneurship is a good thing uh, to democracy or to the social welfare. Uh, I personally believe that the players in the policy arena are motivated mostly from self-interest. And in some cases, it may harm the social welfare. I do know that in some cases, uh, policy entrepreneurship leads to a good thing to society. So this is something we should check empirically uh, and it may change depending on, on, the, on, the, on the, the stand and the position of the policy entrepreneur. But I want to point on at, at another aspect of, of the outcomes of policy entrepreneurship, and this is not on the micro level, not what they've done in health or in education or in school choice or whatever specific policy domain we are talking about. I would like to point at what policy entrepreneurs are doing on the macro level. Because policy entrepreneurship, if I get it right, is one type of political participation. And political partic participation value, it's, it's actually one of the most uh, important values in democracy. So whether they are in the micro level doing good things or bad things to the social welfare, on the macro level, we are increasing political participation channels, and by that increasing democracy. So. I would be very uh, uh, curious to, to, to learn what you're thinking. I think we, we just make a pause yeah. for our speakers to <coughs> respond and then collect more questions. Uh, I'm happy to. Do you, or would you prefer to go? No, let's mix it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to um, thank you for the question. So I'm going to try to uh, just briefly answer that. So your question about uh, the charter schools and the, and the parents and I think one of the interesting things there is that the actions of the policy entrepreneurs do, do does create a, a, a new opportunity space for people who, until that point, particularly, I mean, I think I think about it with respect to education, because that's where I pulled that example from, that there are parents who, for a long time, had felt very frustrated that their child or children were going to schools that they felt were inferior, they really wanted to be going somewhere else, and that I think that the the effort of the policy entrepreneurs in that instance created opportunities for, for parents that weren't there before. And so, in a sense, it's kind of laying the groundwork or catalyzing certain kinds of behaviors. And I and I just wonder whether that's also something that could be replicated across. You could see that, say, with respect to healthcare, uh, environmental issues, a whole lot of things, that there's certain practices that we, we consider part of policy entrepreneurship that actually uh, open up opportunities that weren't there uh, prior to their actions. But I guess that part of that is where does that change, like what level of change is happening? Because if the idea is that the schools are better, but they're not actually better schools, it's just taking all the people who wanted better schools, who are probably more prepared for better schools, and putting them in one place, and all the people who don't ask for better because they may not have the Skills, ability, knowledge. Yeah, it's. Look, I love it. I love the question, and it's, it is actually something that that um, I've, I've spent quite a lot of time uh, think, thinking about. And, and again, you know, I have to have to credit my my PhD supervisors on this, Mark Schneider and Paul Teske, that they they said something that I think is really really helpful, and that's this study of um, that particular individuals that they called market mavens can be going out there and policing the marketplace or pushing the boundaries and all of us benefit. And that's why sometimes my wife is, is, looks at me very frustratedly and says, why don't you go around comparing prices of things? You just bought that straight up without checking. And I just say, I trust that others have played the market sufficiently. That I've got a pretty good value here. And, and, and if I needed to get it cheaper, I'd, I'd expend my time. Doing this. So, so it's sort of like I actually think that that this there's a that the fact of, of all those parents going into a school that maybe hadn't been there before, they then actually raise questions that are questions for the system. Why is it that these motivated parents are sending their kids to those schools and those schools are doing better and it's leaving these other schools not doing so well? So I think the very action, I know it's it's not 
It's not change in the way that we like, but it is a form of it's a form of action that that prompts change, it prompts questions, and I think that is actually quite important. So, on a continuum of change driving activity, I would I would say that that, 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 that the role of motivated consumers can be quite significant for a system. Um, you asked the question about can you ever see change without the policy entrepreneur, and I think that this is what what I take from this is actually. A validation of the claim that I guess I'm, I was trying to make in some ways in, in the paper and in the presentation is that I think it's okay to take policy entrepreneurs off a pedestal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't say that it's some superhuman, uh, brilliant force. And this is actually consistent in a sense with my answer to you is that there's 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 people who are at certain points and processes are, are bringing energy to bear that's very helpful. And what we need to do is kind of understand. Uh, and this, I think your, your point, Peter, was very helpful there. At what point in particular processes does that insertion of energy really make a difference and how does that play out over time? So I think that there's something really important to be studied there. Um, uh, there was a question, um, um, sorry, uh, it was over your, your, your question about um, challenging the concept of change. Uh, sometimes keeping the status quo requires a lot of strategy. Absolutely true. And in fact, if you go right back to, I uh, can't remember his first name, but Say, who S-A-Y wrote about policy entrepreneurs back in about the 1800s or something, uh, noted, wrote about entrepreneurship, noted the incredible resistance that entrepreneurs face. Uh, and and so it's, it's, it's you know, it, you see this today. I mean, the, the kind of people who are trying to, you know, tear down, mm -hmm. people like, you know, the kind of resistance that someone like Steve Jobs faced, for example, you know, very clearly uh, out, out there. Um, so I, I think that, that it's, it's true that as much energy goes into blocking change and blocking uh, entrepreneurs, policy entrepreneurs, as, as their work. But uh, then we don't want to give the whole show away. You know, I mean, there is something about these actors that really matters. And, and I think it sort of comes down, it probably is a normative question. And I want to uh, finish off my comments um, by, by circling back to your point. Um, listen. Um, uh, I... I, I do think that there's there's some work that could be kind of helpful here, and it's, it's um, work by Mark Moore on um, uh, creating public value, a book that he published in 1995. I've, I've been quite impressed by that book. Um, one of the things that, that, that Mark really does is a series of case studies, of basically you could say case studies of um, managers and government, you could say street level bureaucrats who, who in some ways break the rules, and, and lead to better outcomes. That's the whole point of that. I know um, Mark's worked reasonably well because, in fact, the organisation that I work in in Australia, Australia New Zealand School of Government, has used it for a long time to basically train bureaucrats and say, you should be pursuing public value, you should be trying all the time to think about public value. One of my colleagues questioned this, actually wrote quite a, a nasty critique, I mean nasty in the sense that it got personally nasty, but it was quite clever, uh, critique of Mark Moore's work and basically saying, who are these jumped up bureaucrats who think that they have any right to basically say, this is how we should be doing it? In other words, who, who are they to, to say that this is, this is, this is yeah, that is the job of the politician? That's exactly right. And so, so this became a kind of a thing that I don't think Mark has ever proper, 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 you know, properly addressed. Uh, but it is quite a significant question, is how much uh, autonomy should should actors in the system have, and how, how much use should they make of that, even if they're saying they're doing it in the public good? Because this really comes down to your point: is like w what's good and what's evil. Sometimes it's in the eye of the beholder, right? Mm -hmm. So someone could be using a lot of discretion to be pu 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 pursuing something that's um, that's kind of awful, and we we call it policy entrepreneurship. So that must be good. So, so there is a kind of a thing there that needs to be explored. Anyway, I'll stop there. Okay, let me very briefly address some of the questions. Um, in, in very um, good academic uh, sense, I'll only address the ones that I know, and I will not deal with the rest of them. Um, in terms of sort of the, the concept of change, um, I think that every, and I hope to, to see that in all the papers, um, uh, every paper that, that deals with public, public policy outputs or outcomes, however you want to call them, needs to have at least three values. 
uh, status quo, small deviation from the status quo, large deviation from the status quo, and sort of you have gradations and then you can see impact in resisting or not resisting change, but change as a deviation from the status quo is, is, has, has a range of values and we've, we've got to uh, frame them uh, somehow. So that's probably the, the best way, at least for me, to, to, uh, uh, to look at the, the methodology b behind it. In terms of multiple streams, and I'll only talk about that, the idea behind it is, and in fact I recall in some uh, uh, reviews of Kingdon and Cohen, March, and also the, the garbage can model. Um, essentially, probably the biggest contribution that, that Kingdon made to, to public policy in general was the actor-induced change, whereas Cohen, March, and Olson sort of assume, or they didn't explicitly model, the idea of where do actors, you know, uh, where are they in, in this process? Everything seemed to be sort of almost more or less automatic. They talked about energy, uh, whatever that meant. Um, so in that sense, entrepreneurship was, was a great idea in introducing how these actors, and I think of entrepreneurs as, as uh, corporate actors, and you, you, if you have read some of my stuff, you'll see that I talk about individuals or corporate actors, because it, it need not necessarily be an individual, and you need not only have an individual identified, it can be a, sort of an NGO, an agency, you know, uh, many things. Um, which, which is sort of a long introduction to, to the answer uh, that, that um, identifying uh, entrepreneurs uh, don't necessarily look at specific, don't think of them as individuals, think, think of them as actors. And that can sort of stretch the concept, the concept a little bit. Um, in terms of democracy, sort of, I was I, I planted that seed, and of course that was because I'm a, I'm a deviant person. I'm a devious person because I want. I, I had a specific idea in mind to, to try to to get you uh, to get people to think about all of this stuff because it's a. It's there is far more to it than that. Meaning that um, democracy is. I, I define democracy not simply as participatory democracy, however important that may be. You know, having people involved in the process is one way of looking at democracy. It's not the only way. Uh, and, and and that's an interesting idea for entrepreneurship because you also have democracy of outputs. Um, Robert Dahl, some years ago, sort of differentiated between Jeffersonian democracy, which is the participatory stuff, and Madisonian democracy, which is the output, meaning that as long as public policy produces outputs that we all like, however we define we all like, then it's good, it's democratic, uh, which is a very different way of saying, do you participate or not participate? Um, and so, uh, is entrepreneurship, policy entrepreneurship, good for democracy? Well, it depends on what you mean by democracy. And number two, my favorite thing, well, it depends. You know, it's how, uh, what you think is good. You know, what, what does good mean? Because it can go either way. These are unelected officials. And sort of my first um, uh, response to be, no, it's not. Because they are unelected officials. But on the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get good innovation or ideas that um, increase public value uh, at the end. So there was a lot more nuance to the answer. And since I'm not as smart as the rest of you, I invite you to talk about them. And then I will steal your ideas and put them in my writing and come up with even better ways to, to explain this stuff. OK, more questions. Yes. yes. Yeah, may I ask a quick, one question to both of you, Nikos and Michael? It's the same question, of course. Um, policy entrepreneur, policy entrepreneurship is a concept. Nikos, you, you make uh, a reference to the wonderful uh, distinction Eleanor Aston made once uh, frameworks, theories, models. Uh, a policy entrepreneur is not one of them, it's, it's a concept. Mm -hmm. yeah. What you uh, stress, what you emphasize, uh, it's a concept. And we are, I think we are sitting here, we are inclined to start research from that concept. But you could also start from the other end. You could say, well, let's talk about uh, explaining empirical variation. 
Uh, and then my question to both of you, Nikos and Michael, would be what would you uh, focus on then uh, as, as the first dependent variable that comes up to your mind? Do you see what I mean? I don't. <laughs> you are starting talking about policy entrepreneurs from a concept. Okay. I would say, why not start from the other end, starting with what needs to yeah. be explained, empirical variation that mm -hmm. needs explanation. Yeah. And then I would say, what would you say then as the kind of empirical variation that needs to be explained? That's my question. You mean status quo, small change? Well, if that's your answer, that's an answer. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> well, that's you already I mean, have that's my answer. answer. <laughs> that's hey, okay. okay. And Michael, I want to hear Michael's answer oh. as well. Do you want to Well, I think it's like, you know, like this, this set of like the UN goals. Yeah. Um, that I think that this actually lends, lends itself to, to, to really a lot of a lot of study. What would the study would be of starting by saying what jurisdictions have have been have have say made uh, sustain particular sustainability uh, efforts and been more successful than others in that. And what, why is that? You know, and, and, and I mean we could we could explain a lot there without even beginning to think about policy entrepreneurs. Uh, it could just be purely about a resource pump or something like that. Um, so I would I, I would start with the change. I think I'd start with yeah. change. But then you could actually, I mean, if you were looking at a, say, I mean, what, one thing in the US you could do this in, the, in, in, in a place like Australia, you could look at, say, the, the local level uh, and, and, and say the change could be from no change at all to quite a high level of change and then start to say, well, what structurally might be the things that are driving that? And it would be, you know, you'd be filtering down quite a long way, I think, before you'd actually say, so where might policy entrepreneurship um, have, have, have a role to play here? I think that's how I'd approach it. Okay, that's nice. Thank you. Um, my question is about the state of the field. And I wanted to ask uh, forward to what uh, Alex uh, said. Uh, which goal do you think is the main goal today? Or which question would, like, would you like to uh, mainly answer? Uh, are you aiming to uh, determine or to predict um, who is more likely to be a policy entrepreneur, or are you want to uh, are you trying to predict uh, which uh, policy entrepreneurs will have a bigger odds to uh, to change policy, okay, to make a change? I think it's related to, a bit to the I, I would like to ask a bit on looking at policy entrepreneurs on the individual level or on more on an organizational level, ministries, NGOs, uh, social movements. You said you can have it both, but how then would it discern? Do we look at the same, do they have the same characteristics? Um, does their actions look the same if we think about like the Ministry of Finance or a woman in rights movement? Then, if we think on individual, individual persons, uh, if the dependent variable is the change, then you focus only on the successful entrepreneur and not on the unsuccessful. When I used to be a bureaucrat, <coughs> tax authority, many tried to make changes and didn't succeed, and some some did succeed with, from within the system. Sometimes there are technical changes, sometimes there are more uh, like policy changes, but there were many that didn't succeed. So taking it that away. Yeah. But the failures, start, the failures can be more relevant. Yeah. For sure, yeah. they are entrepreneurs yeah. per se. Yeah. Well, they can have a question and you have time to respond. Yeah. Just one more, okay. Uh, you know, I, I came to the, actually I came back to the concept for, uh, of uh, policy entrepreneur because uh, when I started doing research back in Mexico, uh, in order to explain not just change but also failure, uh, there was one variable that was missing in my models. So I, I was more trained into an institutional uh, 
framework, right? And every now and then, doing my research, I will find people saying, well, is this person, is this person, is this person, who will explain where did we succeed or not? And for this uh, research I'm doing now, uh, I also came across the literature on leadership. So leadership could also be borrowed uh, as a concept to this. And I want to know first, what would be the difference between the literature in, in leadership and the literature in uh, policy and entrepreneurship? Um, and also that I could see how this could be good or bad for democracy dependence on what the leader or what the entrepreneur, because for instance, now we have a president that he started as a policy, what we can call policy you're, entrepreneur. You are recording right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said that back in Mexico anyway. So, uh, so and, but he, he, once he took power, he became a very authoritarian uh, president, or he's now a very authoritarian president. So, good or bad for democracy, I will say it depends. Uh, it will depend. But well, anyway, that's. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, okay, so we had three questions. What would be the more valuable, valuable question to answer, or more important question to ask? What you're doing is actually you're saying, well, do we want entrepreneurship? Explain entrepreneurship as a dependent variable, or look at the impact of entrepreneurship as the independent variable? Well. Like a good academic both. Yay! Do both. Um, I think the more, it depends on, on your question and the more, what are you trying to accomplish with sort of the study? I would venture to say the more valuable one would be when, when you're looking at the impact of rather than who is going to become an entrepreneur and, and, and not. Um, but, but I don't think there is any intrinsic value to one or the other, I would venture to say, because you'll have more to say if you're looking at the impact rather than, uh, than uh, who is going to become and who is not going to become. <coughs> In terms of entrepreneurs uh, and change uh, and resistance to change, um, I think absolutely. Uh, the way that, that I saw sort of uh, Michael's sort of the quadrants, that, that matrix, uh, was yes, you, you, when you're looking at things, you've got to look at failures as well. And, and, and there's, there's a whole lot to be said about that. And in fact, every um, study also needs to include sort of um, variation. You've got to have variation in the dependent variable. So not everything has to succeed. You've got to figure out why it has failed and all of that stuff. So certainly, it's a much more complicated, that is, issue methodologically that needs to be addressed. Uh, and, and I agree with you uh, 100%, although stra uh, studies of failure are very difficult because there are very few reasons why things succeed. There are so many reasons why things fail. Um, finally, leadership and entrepreneurship. I think the different. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. There's a lot of overlap between the two. I think the, the difference is position, institutional position. Leadership is always at sort of the very top, uh, whereas entrepreneurship can be at the top or it can be at the bottom. Street level bureaucracy, you're at the bottom, but you're still sort of having an impact in that sense. But many of the strategies may very uh, may be very much similar. In fact, I have used uh, leadership theories to talk about policy entrepreneurship. I just called it political entrepreneurship, so that there is a little bit of uh, variation. But yes, I, I see a considerable overlap between the two uh, theories. Is it good or bad for democracy? I said what I needed to say about democracy. It's a big, big. Uh, Question and I don't. You're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's, it depends on how you define democracy. I think that's that's the key issue. And once you you make that definition, uh, then it will be a lot easier for for you to to answer the question. Well, I think that because um, his answers are, are, are good, I think I don't really want to add anything there. Other than to say, I think that the question about why study. Um, policy entrepreneurs and for what purpose. I, I, I do think that there's, uh, 
also, if you could of... refer again to the of actors and individuals. Ah. What's that, sorry? On the differentiation between actors and individuals right. in entrepreneurship, of, in actors, policy yeah. entrepreneurship. Yeah. Organization yeah. and individuals. Like, right, the right, difference right. between individual right. entrepreneurs and policy right, 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 right. Looking right. how, so, how it fits in. I think there's a really, um, it's, it's something that I think, think needs to be explored more because I, I think it's, that rarefication of the individual doesn't really help. In, in terms of like saying, if this, if, if a particular individual hadn't been, like, like let's say with, with, with healthcare reform in, in the US, I know it's kind of being slowly unpicked, right, but that, um, you know, people kind of basically say that, that Obama, there was a window of opportunity that Obama took, blah, 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 but there was actually an enormous amount of agenda setting work that went on. Sure. Uh, and that Mark, Mark Peterson has written quite a nice article about that. So I think that, that, that we just have to be quite careful about about the fixation on, on particular individuals. Um, but I think, you know, from a methodological perspective, sometimes you might want to do that. So I think that the Zen, if we want to become, if you like, more honest about change processes, then you probably have to actually find, you know, more effective kind of methodological tools. And when, I mean, I think that the work you've done on, the, on networks is a really great example of how you situate the individual within a kind of a, if you like, a kind of a cloud of influence and, and explore that whole Thing through that's that strikes me as a pretty pretty helpful way forward. Uh, sophisticated methodology that kind of crowds out people like me from kind of pursuing it, but but that that does strike me as a as a very um, a very effective way forward. Uh, and, and 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 you know you could within the kind of work you've done, obviously you you're much more qualified to speak about it than me. But but you you, you could you, you can actually talk about policy entrepreneurs as, as having more or less. Uh, effective strategies, and, and 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 that doesn't take away from the things that they've achieved as a result of, of of the actions that they and others did. Just one thing, though, I, I guess I, I think that the the question about studying and for what purpose is that I I certainly think that there's a really important kind of disciplinary point, you know, like as in social scientists trying to understand and, and explain phenomenon uh, and, and make changes in that way. Um, and, and that's, that's important work that, that we should be pursuing and, and, and just to do that in and of itself is, is entirely sufficient. But I personally like the idea of um, having, having work like that, that that people who are wanting to make change happen can learn from. So I think that there is a part of me that uh, you know, s strongly supports those who, who want to make the world a better place and if there's something in the kind of work that we do that can give insights to others that, that are willing to be changed leaders, then I think that's really fantastic. But, you know, if we, we could see that as a byproduct of this stuff. I think to, in order to do that really well, um, we would actually have to, we would have to be really good theorists. So it's kind of like, you know, I know what it is. There's nothing more practical than a good theory. That's, <laughs> so, so probably working at the level of, of answering theoretical questions in a, in, a, in a methodologically rigorous way, one of the really nice byproducts of that is that you might actually be able to inspire people in your classes, uh, hey, if you want to make change happen, here is something you might have, have to do. You Don't just think that you can be a lone hero, you've got to be thinking a lot about context and so on and so forth. Yes. Yeah, um, I have like this horrible question, but I think it's good if we, if we can talk about it uh, on the first day, which is about the boundaries of the concept of uh, policy entrepreneur. And I think it's good, Michael, you uh, raised the question and you ask whether there are a distinct class of actors. Um, but no, I would like to have an, an answer or a reflection about that. And I very much liked the, the comment of Schlomo, I think it was, uh, of saying maybe policy entrepreneur is not only about policy change, but uh, also about defending the statu quo. So I think that's very right. But then if we, we have the actor who are um, entrepreneurs because they defend the statu quo, and we have those who foster policy change, then where are the boundaries of the, of the concept? And for instance, policy broker, I see it's much more precise because that person is at the intersection between two universes and can translate the things. So it's, it depends on the positioning of the person. But policy entrepreneur, it's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, sure. Okay. Um, 
the boundaries and a little bit about uh, the question I didn't uh, respond to uh, before um, uh, about individuals and, and you know corporate actors and which one is better. Um, part of the problem that, that you'll find in, in, in trying to answer questions regarding entrepreneurship is that the same individuals may not necessarily be involved in every stage of the process. Uh, so um, specifying it down to the level of a single individual is probably not a wise choice, uh, primarily because it makes it idiosyncratic. You run into those problems. And two, um, perhaps the, the more interesting question is, what happens if it's two different individuals involved in different uh, parts of the process, but they all come from the same sort of institution, uh, which tells you that sort of they're all trained to think alike. It's just that they're involved in different stages, but pursuing or pushing the same um, ideas. And uh, the reason why I'm thinking that's, that's very important is because, at least empirically, I have realized that in order to get anything done or to oppose anything getting done, is you've got to have somebody who's present in the right kind of meetings pushing for it. There's always somebody pushing for an idea. Ideas don't float on their own. They've got to have somebody doing that. And in that sense, entrepreneurship becomes uh, important but not as an individual. I think of it as, as an actor. That's why I said I think it's a much more uh, fruitful approach to think of it as such. Where are the boundaries of policy, broker, etc.? I think of it as slightly differently um, in the sense that I look at brokers as a type of entrepreneur, that is, as a strategy, if you like. And I, at some point, I've differentiated between sort of attributes and strategies. And you have that, you know, who are entrepreneurs and what do entrepreneurs do? And sort of brokering is, in my opinion, a, a strategy. Um, is there a boundary, you know, who is not an entrepreneur? Let's, let's sort of reverse the, uh, the question. That's a very difficult question, but I don't think, personally, it can be answered theoretically. It must only be answered uh, empirically. So the, the answer, that, the standard answer that I give is, you know, they are individuals who have, entrepreneurs, are individuals who have um, interest. You gotta be interested, you gotta be involved, you have to have access. And you have to have to uh, uh, spend expend resources in doing so. Um, does anybody want to do? Can anybody do that? Um, possibly, depending on the issue. Is are they going to do that at all times? That is, what is the universe of uh, possible entrepreneurs in any specific situation? Well, relatively small. Not that many people are willing to spend as much time uh, with all of this stuff. But what exactly they do, they broker, they advocate, whatever it is, uh, that to me is a matter of strategy, hence sort of the whole presentation that I gave about, you know, when do they do what. Michael? Uh, look, I think it's kind of freaked me out over the years, actually, that question. <laughs> and I was, probably at some point when I was studying policy entrepreneurs, I thought, well, yeah, it could, the whole thing, the whole cake, could kind of crave it, right? Um, but on the other hand, I, I think that it's it's kind of partly the the fact that there have been people. You know, this is a field where people have been con continuously like throwing up examples of how entrepreneurial behaviour made a difference. That has been you know, incredibly inspiring to me. So I think we should push on, and I think it's really it's, it's you know now I think that, that that kind of question is exactly the question we should be asking. And I think we've got, we're in a much better position to answer it than probably we were even a decade ago. Uh, and, 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 and doing so would be, would be quite strong, I think, for improving our understanding of the concept, if you like. Any more last questions? I wanted to comment on something. I just wanted to say, comment about, um, about bureaucrats and as policy entrepreneurs and democracy. I think that policy entrepreneurs don't make the decisions, but rather just give ideas or think of problems and then just bring it to the forward and let politicians decide. So I think in that term it doesn't really clash or it doesn't clash as much. Does this mean that politicians can be? Can be, but policy entrepreneurs don't 
don't make the decisions. They just bring the ideas. Well, they might, they but they, might. they don't they have to. Necessary. I'm saying that it doesn't, it doesn't it's not necessarily, necessarily yeah. It's not, it doesn't necessarily. Mm. And in, in business administration, uh, I think it's Art uh, Stevenson and Dark, the DL, if I said it correctly, one of their defined uh, uh, characteristics, one of the defining characteristics of policy entrepreneurs are they regard it to individuals, but individuals uh, who don't have the necessary resources to achieve, to accomplish the goal by themselves. Sure. So, uh, uh, perhaps this uh, is supposed to be part of, of our definition to, to police entrepreneurs. Because politician, if you are acting as a president and you are facing, a, 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 um, if, you are, um, if you pass any um, decision, or if, if you are the majority in, 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 the, in, in the Congress and you can uh, promote a, a legislation, it's, it will not be a policy entrepreneurship. But if the same politician don't have the necessary resources to accomplish the goal, the goal, this goal by himself, then perhaps it would be easier to, 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 to define him as a policy entrepreneur. I, I, I see this. Uh, number one, um, you're right, they don't make decisions, but they bias the decisions. I mean, writing the bill is yeah. so important uh, in, in sort of biasing what, what the outcome uh, will be without necessarily making it. So in the sense, if you want to think about it, they're not at the policy making level, but they are maybe at the policy meso level, where where you 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 have much more than a, a, sort of a passing interest uh, in all of this stuff. You have considerable knowledge. You are part of the process without necessarily being the actual decision maker at the end. We tend to think of policy making as these incredible battles in Congress or in Parliament where you know they, they sway this uh, preferences one way or another. Nothing could be further from the truth, of course. Most of it is done actually behind the scenes, etc. And going back to the original sort of stuff that Kingdon said, he defined or he looked at entrepreneurs as primarily insiders. Um, he was thinking of bureaucrats and insiders, the, the, the government uh, pushing for it, and then the concept of sort of expanded uh, uh, to incorporate other individuals. So I think um, it's, 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 they're, they're not policy makers per se, uh, but they're not just simple bureaucrats. There is more to it uh, than that. You have the last yeah. word. No. <laughs> no. You do last have the last word. word. Yes. So it's basically to pick up a little bit on, on this discussion about the normative dimension of policy entrepreneurship or democracy because I, I think it's a lot to be said there. And I think uh, it's a very attractive answer to say that it does contribute, but at the same time to answer you, Naomi, is whose interests are they pr like putting in front of this elected official? And then if you think of this, um, also of your scheme with multiple streams and the fact that it's basically they have insights from, from the policy clients, right? And, and that's how, but policy clients are a particular social group, most likely in welfare policy, the disadvantaged group. Then of course, um, here you would have basically pushed forward the interests of the, the say working and lower classes, but how about the interests of the middle or the upper classes? then we're not talking actually about participatory democracy in the ideal um, sense. And then related to this, there was this discussion about, okay, not good or bad, but if they do a good or a bad thing. And I think it's difficult to, is, to talk about good or bad, but rather it's, it's about good or bad from which ideological perspective. And I wonder to what extent what they do when they do things can escape this left-right dimension of of the ideological scale, so what kind of ethical dilemmas they have in this sense, and, and is it good or bad from which perspective? So maybe this is also interesting to bring ideology into the question, because we're talking about politics in the end. Okay, I'll bring up a thought that's not very good at articulating it, but looking on how research is developing, or on, in social change, on how we understand policy change, to my understanding, we once looked on mainly on organizations or big labor movements 
as or other groups as driving as driving change. And then we look on different plural interest groups. And I'm wondering if the focus, and, and the language is a language of individuality, even as you say, it is not necessarily specific individuals. I'm trying to understand if this new focus is because we forgot them, they were always there, or if it's also reflecting some trend where we are less, or maybe less believe, or less legitimized, organized, uh, or organized political mobilization, and we started to look on things from how just individual changed them. I'll give it a bit into a context, like I'm coming from social work, and we, we are very much interested in <coughs> areas of social, of social change. And also, within social work, like if, it was for, if the idea was of mobilizing groups, using labor groups or other groups, it's now policy practice, where the individual, work, the individual social worker or, or the individual bureaucrat becomes on his own uh, the person who has the responsibility to, to change, to, say, to change the situation. So just. Okay. okay. All right. Um, <laughs> In terms of the sort of the this focus on, on entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship actually is, is a fascinating one. I think part of the reason why uh, this concept was introduced when it was introduced was um, sort of <coughs> to I don't know how to how to say that in uh, to, to to supplement if you'd like or or in opposition to I don't know structural theories of, of, of political change you have to remember all of this stuff was done in the 70s and early 80s think of structural theories as, as Marxism and stuff like that where you have these big sort of variables that if you put them together then things happen and the idea behind it was well things you know things don't happen yeah, but people make things happen and therefore you, you know where do individuals fit within uh, all of this stuff it was real uh, re